Hi, I'm Antonia. This is Universally Me. Please follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Antonia Carlotta and support my work on Patreon, patreon.com slash Antonia Carlotta. So you may have seen my last video about Universal's 1934 imitation of life, but just in case you missed it, here's a quick recap. There were actually two imitation of life films. The one that I will talk about most today is the 1934 version. Imitation of Life is based off of the book by Fanny Hurst, which came out in 1933. A struggling widow and her daughter take in a black housekeeper and her fair-skinned daughter. The two women start a successful business, but face familial identity and racial issues along the way. Imitation of Life is always touted as this incredible boundary-pushing, progressive film. And in some ways it is, but I always just took that at face value. I often would say that Imitation of Life was one of my favorite Universal films. I knew that there were some issues with it, things that if you were to make it today wouldn't fly, but this was made in 1934 and looking at it through that lens, as far as I could tell, this movie really was everything everyone said. So while I was researching, I was surprised and dismayed to find articles written by members of the black community the very year this film came out, criticizing it and pointing out ways that it was harmful for the community. So not like articles from today looking back and we've evolved, but actual valid criticism from 1934. Once I knew those critiques were out there, it was impossible not to watch the whole movie with a more critical eye. And then it didn't feel right to make a video about the film without addressing these things. Now, I'm not 100% condemning this film. I have not even 100% figured out how I feel in light of this information. But these things do exist and they deserve a second look. But this movie is worth watching. In 2005, it was selected for preservation by the United States National Film Registry of the Library of Congress. And in 2007, Time Magazine named it one of the 25 most important films about race. So watch this movie. When the film starts, Claudette Colbert plays B, a widow who's struggling to keep her husband's business going and care for her young daughter. Louise Beavers, playing Delilah, accidentally shows up at her door looking for a housekeeping position. It turns out she got the address wrong, but she is able to talk herself into a job, and in exchange, she and her young daughter Piola will live with B and B's young daughter Jessie. B and Delilah actually end up forming a friendship as the movie goes on, and they team up together using Delilah's secret family pancake recipe to start a pancake business together. This friendship and the business are part of what's so progressive about this film. A black woman and a white woman in business together, two single women and mothers at that. And yes, for 1934, this is absolutely more than you can expect from most films. But there are still some things that are pretty uh, about this. For starters, Louise Beavers is playing a mammy. And that's the term that I found used in the letters, not just a modern word for it. A mammy is a historical stereotype of a black woman working for a white family, usually raising the kids or taking care of household duties. They're generally played older, overweight, really happy, amiable, kind of a caricature of a real person. They will usually do anything for their boss, putting the needs of the family they work for over their own needs or the needs of their family. To demonstrate just how much of a character Louise Beavers was playing, Louise Beavers was raised in Pasadena, California, and was not naturally an overweight person. But she would have to keep her weight up or wear padding and put on a thick Southern accent to play the roles that Hollywood wanted her to play. Despite the fact that Delilah's the one that provides the secret pancake recipe, and she does a lot of the manual labor, B only offers her 20% of the profits, which is pretty lame. What's even worse is that in the film, Delilah doesn't even want to accept the 20%. When B tells her that she could buy her own house or a car, Delilah literally responds saying, you want to send me away? But I want to live with you. I'm your cook and I want to stay your cook. I'm sure some people will argue this is a stretch, but I see this as a way to reinforce power structures and white superiority and to make white people feel better about it that black people could have opportunities, they just choose not to, or that they're happy the way things are. But why would Delilah want to stay B's housekeeper? 
Why would she choose to rub her feet like she does later in the movie? Or happily stay downstairs and miss out on a party filled with white people in her own house celebrating her own business? There's a great scene too. At the end of the night when they're going to sleep, it shows B ascending up the stairs into the light and Delilah descending down into the darkness. And it's a beautiful shot, but I don't think the film goes far enough here because it's impossible to tell if they're highlighting the disparity to make a statement or instead just accepting things as they are. The other issue that gets addressed but doesn't go far enough is that of Piola passing. Passing in this instance means that because Piola is so light-skinned, she's able to pass or pretend that she's white. I'm not black. I'm not black. I won't be black. And yes, it is huge that in this time, the topic was so openly discussed the way that it was. And even more so because Freddie Washington, who played Piola, really was black. But Piola spends the entirety of the movie trying to run and hide from her blackness, and we as the audience never get to learn why. Now, maybe in some ways they just felt it didn't need explanation, that it was already understood that black meant bad or sad. But I actually think this was just another way of not wanting to offend audiences or make white people feel bad. Piola would rather run away, drop out of college, cut off her mom forever than live in her blackness. And it would be better if we knew what that really meant. I mentioned in my last video that the censors required script changes all the way up until two weeks after filming had begun. But I didn't really know what those changes entailed. I often read and follow the TCM film forums. And while I was discussing Imitation of Life, I learned something pretty astounding while talking to a poster who goes by Top Build. He told me about a note in the AFI catalog that discussed a lynching scene that had been removed. Apparently in the scene, a black man is almost hanged for approaching a white woman whom he believed had given him an invitation. There's a memorandum that the censors met with Carl Lemley Jr. and Universal's general manager, Harry Zayner. The censors were apparently completely against Piola's whole plot line and definitely against the lynching scene. In reading their explanation and talking it over with Top Build, I think he had a pretty good interpretation, which was that the censors believed that the lynching scene might cause audiences to sympathize too much with the black characters, and it would then justify Piola feeling like she had to hide being black. Then there was the marketing for this film. Though we now know it to be a film about race and Piola and Delilah have significant screen time, they were all but forgotten when it came to advertising. When Imitation of Life came out, it was sold as a romance and a love triangle, even though that's such a side story in my opinion. Louise Beavers and Freddie Washington were left out of all promotions, really. They weren't really billed, they were not as front and center as everybody else. I even found one instance in a Universal Weekly where every single character and side character and Carl Lemley and Fanny Hurst had a picture and nothing for Freddie or Louise. And then of course, the actual critiques I found written by the black community. Students at Oberlin College petitioned their local theaters not to play Imitation of Life, saying that it was filled with vicious anti-black propaganda and it was an insult to their common intelligence and the ideals that they were working for. According to the newspaper, an overwhelming majority of black students on campus signed the petition. They wanted to be clear that this was in no way a criticism of Louise Beavers or Freddie Washington. They understood that these were likely the only roles that they were being offered and that they have to act in the way the director tells them, but they still felt that the film itself perpetuated negative stereotypes. Sterling Brown, a black professor, poet, and literary critic agreed that the film wasn't revolutionary and that it reinforced white superiority and Anglo-Saxon self-esteem. Perhaps most frustrating was Fanny Hurst's response to the critiques. In response to a letter she received asking why she chose to portray the black characters the way she did, she countered that antagonism precedes understanding, further insulting the feelings, the experiences, and the intelligence of the black community. That she, a white woman, knew better and that they just didn't understand. Though Fanny Hurst was active in the black community and she championed black writers and artists, she still spoke and wrote about them in a condescending and stereotypical way. 
If Imitation of Life was so progressive and Fanny Hurst was so progressive, you'd think that she would want to hear from the very people she claims to be representing. Finally, I just thought it was so interesting to be learning about all of this so soon after the Green Book controversy at the Oscars earlier this year. There were a lot of parallels in the making and criticisms of these films. And I guess I found it a little bit disheartening because yeah, there was probably more backlash this year than in 1934, but have we really not made progress in 85 years? Anyway, I am sure that this video is going to be kind of polarizing, but I would love to know what everybody thinks. Do you think that these criticisms are valid? Do you think that the film is still super progressive? Where do you stand? I know for sure I'm gonna keep reading and kind of mulling it over and figuring out exactly where I am on the scale, but I appreciate you all along for the journey. Please don't forget to follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Antonia Carlotta and support my work on Patreon. Thanks so much. Bye.